Yes, I'm here again. It's going to be hot. They say it's going to be 100 and, 104 uh, today here in Sacramento. And that means it's going to be at least five degrees hotter than that in our backyard. If it looks like I'm kind of gloomy and, and my office is darkened, for the moment, my office is, is pretty cool, okay? And I try to keep it that way. Uh, I'm kind of shaded with, uh, with trees and stuff here. So uh, we're in survival mode here. But does that mean it's going to stop class? No. Hey, Tarot of Ceremonial Magic. This is what a new one looks like. This is, this is what mine looks like, okay? Is this a tarot book? Yes, it's a tarot book. And it's a Kabbalah tarot book, too, I might add. Okay. Is it an Enochian book? I mean, more than an Enochian. Is it sort of an Enochian primer? Uh, can you do Enochian with this book? Well, you can, yes. Is it an Enochian book? Let's see if I can find you. Yes, oh, Enochian stuff all over the place here. Okay, yes. Of course it's an Enochian book. How much would you pay for a book that's like this? For That's a tarot book and an Enochian book. Something you could put in your knapsack and take on a desert island with you. Don't answer. There's more. It's a Goetia book. Yes, it's a Goetia book, too. A Goetia primer with all the 72 spirits, what they do, how to call them up. Now, how much would you pay for a book like this? What trouble you could get into with just this book. You don't have to have the tarot deck that goes with it. It'd be very nice if you did. I guess the point I'm trying to make is, even though the book is called Tarot of Ceremonial Magic, you don't have to have the tarot cards. Okay, the tarot cards are illustrated enough in the, in the deck. It's that tarot is the DNA of the Kabbalah. Tarot is the DNA of elemental... Uh, uh, Enochian magic. Tarot is even the DNA of the structure of the Goetic spirits. Tarot represents a, a, a an apartment building, a block of flats, where in each room is a, 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 is a separate spiritual compartment where people who are or spirits who are who are cabalistically uh, uh, connected through the the DNA pattern of the of the Kabbalah have to share a room okay and some of the rooms are suites that 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 have several several spirits uh, within them and they're all organized in tight ass and anal retentive neatness structured on the tarot. Anyway, this is one of the oldest, I think it's the only, only the second book that I did with Weiser way back in, um, way back in 1995, okay. Anyway, I'm going to continue with the Goetic portion of uh, of the literally the appendix of this uh, this book here and today we're going to deal specifically with uh, the technical elements of uh, Goetic magic the circle the triangle now this illustration was in the very first edition of my life with the spirits 
there were two color plates, one a Nokian and one one this. But this is my my personal magical circle. Okay. Uh, I wish I could tell you that I had a big, beautiful floor cloth with all of this information, all of this uh, uh, imagery on it, but I don't. I'm really a funky guy. This is in my brain what I have, okay, when I designed it. But my circle is a length of silk cord. My triangle is a, a carpenter's segmented ruler that I fold up into a, to a, I'm a lazy guy. But my magic tools are as real as if they were made of gold. And so will yours. If you can't make a magical implement out of paper, you can't make it out of anything. We're picking up where we left off yesterday with elements of Goetic evocation. The circle and triangle are two are the two most important physical uh, elements of a Goetic evocation, and are considered indispensable. Now, the I'm digressing here. The reason they're indispensable dispensable is, look at it this way, Goetic magic is a specific uh, technique of personal, personal uh, uh, magic. It's the technique, it's the formula of the technique that makes it, that makes it work. Okay, you can do all sorts of other magic. You can, you can even call spirits in a million different ways, okay? But Solomonic magic has certain things that make it Solomonic magic. And now there's plenty of ways that you can tinker with it or, or abbreviate it like, like I do, but if you're going to do a Goetic evocation and use the formula of it and make that mechanism work, you're going to at least have to have the basics of the machinery. And the basics of the machinery in Goetic evocation are a circle that you stand in and a triangle that you put the, the angel or the spirit or the demon in. That's the drill. That's the machine. Okay. And that's why I say it's indispensable. Even if your circle is a belt that you're wearing around your waist. And believe me, I've, I've done just that. Okay. I digress. Uh, the two most important physical, oh boy, I'm just moving right along here this morning, uh, are the indispensable. See figures, uh, okay, and I got figures here, and I show, okay, it's, it's in the book. There's a classic one, and I'll, I'll dilate on, on all of that stuff. See all those Hebrew letters? All those Hebrew letters are the divine names uh, of the uh, of the spiritual forces of all ten, well, technically all nine, uh, Sephiroth on the tree of life, the God name, the archangels, things like that. Big guns. Okay. The operator stands in the center of a circle, representative of the infinite universe and the magician's own aura. It's a place of balance and stability. The circle is protected by divine names sacred to the magician. For the duration of the ceremony, the magician never steps outside the circle. The spirit is called forth into a triangle placed about three feet east of the circle. The base of the triangle is positioned toward the circle. The triangle is framed by three names considered holy by the magician. 
if the names don't seem holy to you, if you don't understand them, if you can't wrap your your soul around th those names being uh, sacred to you, if you can't imagine that those uh, those names and effects it on, if it doesn't mean anything to you, it's not going to mean anything to the spirit either. So find your own divine names. Find your own names of power. Find the names that you trim your triangle with. Names that are so important to you that if in the middle of the night when you're deep, deep asleep and you're having a, a, a vision or, a, or even a nightmare, what words do you use what that would carry the power to dissolve the spirit or to 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 uh, uh, order the denizens of the infernal regions or or call forth the 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 highest echelon of of angelic heavens what would those words be figure it out those are the words that you use and if all of the Hebrew stuff doesn't make any sense to you, even if all the Thelemic stuff doesn't make sense to you, don't use it. If it doesn't mean anything to you, it doesn't mean anything to the spirit. And you're just, you know, I'm not going to try to scare you. You're not walking into trouble. You're just w wasting your time. Okay. A copy of the spirit's seal is placed inside the triangle, and another copy of the seal with a pentagram, and I've got a picture of it there, inscribed upon the reverse side is worn as a medallion around the neck of the magician. Upon the spirit's arrival, both sides of the medallion are displayed to the spirit to force it to obedience. It's like showing your badge. It's not only saying, hey, Look, I'm the sheriff here. Not only that, but I got a specific warrant for your arrest. Okay, that's the spirit sigil. So you show the badge, that's your pentagram, just like a sheriff's badge. And not only that, I'm here for you. Okay. Uh, the magician should also have a version of the hexagram of Solomon, which is a star of David pinned to your robe somewhere would work if it means the macrocosm to you, if it means uh, uh, that you're working for the, the uh, supreme singularity of the cosmos. When I first uh, uh, whipped up a, a spirit... Uh, for the exorcism of a uh, of that school I talked about uh, when the spirit appeared in the in the triangle, I held up the the uh, spirit's sigil that I had around my neck, and I said, "Do you see that? What is it?" And I made it say, it's my sign. And then I turned the pentagram ar around to show the pentagram. And I said, what's that? And it says, it's, it's the sign that binds me. And it almost did it sarcastically. And then the next thing I showed the hexagram said, what's that? And it said, it's a sign that binds you. And I'd never looked at it quite like that before. And when the spirit said that, the hair on the back of my neck went, whoa, that's the wisest thing I've ever heard. Heard coming out of the mouth of a thing like that. Okay. So the magician should have a version of the hexagram of Solomon pinned or otherwise displayed somewhere on his or her robe. The magician must feel absolutely confident in his or her justification and ability to call upon the spirit. In the classic text, 
the magician spends a great deal of time praising the greatness of God and itemizing all the miracles wrought by him, in this case, through the holy personages of the past. You did it for Moses. You did it for Elijah. Won't you please do it for me? This shameless brown nosing was very necessary to medieval magicians whose psyche was imprinted with a literal belief in biblical events, not to mention heaven and hell itself. The modern magician must achieve the same exalted feeling of divine justification in his or her conjuration. The method will vary between individuals, but the result must be an unambiguous feeling of self-righteous justification. I can't stress how important that is. That's your power, that's your energy, that's your electricity. After this attitude is achieved, the next phase is to induce a subjective state of mind so that communication with the spirit does not seem to be an absurd, irrational occurrence. This has been done traditionally by the recitation of barbarous words of evocation. Continuous babbling of these strange sounding words serves to excite the magician's imagination and refocus the mind to a sphere where communication with a demon is not an unthinkable activity. I've included at the end of this appendix, how much would you pay for a book like this? Don't answer. I've included at the end of this appendix a version of the preliminary invocation of the Goetia that contains the classic barbarous words of evocation. For years, my only conjuration was this invocation. In Aleister Crowley's personal copy of the Goetia, he had transcribed the first Enochian call in the angelic language. See the appendix at the end of this book. Where can you find that? Right here. The, he transcribed the first Enochian call. Okay. Um, but I digress. For years, my only conjuration was this invocation. But in Alistair Crowley's personal copy, uh, he had that uh, first Enochian call leading some scholars to speculate that in his lat latter years, Crowley discovered that the Enochian calls could be used as Goetic evocations. They certainly put you in an altered state of mind, which is necessary, part of the formula of a Goetic ceremony. I have found that the recitation of the first and second Enochian calls in place of more traditional conjurations and barbarous words of evocation is indeed a most efficacious conjuration. Do what you want, do what you have to do to get to the altered state of mind. After years and years, I found that that really does the trick. It's been suggested that the proper state of mind can be attained through the ingestion of psychoactive substances. I hasten to caution the reader that even though I believe it's possible to access the magical plane by uses of drugs, it's difficult, if not impossible, to properly execute the remaining necessary components of the ritual. In other words, you may be able to evoke a spirit while high 
but then may discover that it's difficult to remember what exactly you wanted to do with it. This is a very dangerous place to be. Once you feel exalted and justified and have put yourself in the receptive state of mind, nothing remains but to call the spirit. And no matter what technique is used, the power that accomplishes this is your will. Even though the original texts contain a series of progressively stronger conjurations and constraints, which are to be used if the spirit is reluctant to appear, it's my belief that if you are properly exalted and justified, the spirit will come without additional conjurations or curses. Look, these guys want to come through and get you out of... <laughs> Never mind. Never mind. If you're confident and it is your will to whip this little sucker up, they come. If you have a second or third uh, or fourth conjuration ready because you're not confident that your first conjuration will work, then you will most likely need them all. If, on the other hand, the spirit has promised to do something for you and fails, you're obliged to threaten them in a subsequent evocation. Now, you don't have to start off by threatening them. But if they lie to you, if they don't do what they said, then you got to put your foot down. That's part of the formula of Goetic evocation. That's part of the formula of Solomonic magic. You can rightly say, oh, you should be kind to the spirits. You should, uh, of course you do, once they're working for you, once they understand who it is they're working for and who it is they're dealing with. Until then, sort of like a like a, a, an un, untrained dog. You know, I have friends with pit bulls who, who are potentially very dangerous creatures. And if they weren't properly trained, there'd be a danger to the owner and to the neighborhood. But when they're properly trained, they're just the sweetest, lovable, loyalist kind of creatures. But anyway, the ultimate threat is to destroy the spirit by burning its seal. This represents total annihilation of the spirit. To give the spirit a taste of punishment, it is the traditional custom to put the seal in a small box. And I showed you that box yesterday. Sometimes perforated with holes with a small amount of sulfur at the bottom. And if you don't have sulfur, rubber bands. Rubber bands smell bad too, okay. Um, a chain should be attached to two sides of the box being careful not to step outside the circle, the magician uses the blade of the magical sword to suspend the box over a fire. The fire is also in the triangle. If you're gearing up for this part of a ceremony. While he or she reminds the spirit of its original obligation. If after this act of ceremonial intimidation, the spirit has not obeyed to your satisfaction, make good on your threat and destroy its seal. Okay, uh, uh, I got a footnote. A copy of the seal, hand drawn on paper or parchment, is adequate. It should not be necessary for you to destroy your actual ceremonial magic card, because these seals of the spirits are on these cards. And I don't want you to burn the tarot deck here. Do not attempt to call that particular spirit ever again. 
I mean, he's out of it, okay? Even if it was a brain cell, you, you can live happily forever without one seventy seventh of a, of a portion of your consciousness. You may or may not actually see the spirit. You may only sense its presence. Once you know it's in the triangle, give it its orders, which is called a charge. You charge the spirit with its duties and demand that it agrees to comply. Be very precise in your wording of the charge and make sure there are no loopholes in your demands. Be polite, but don't dawdle or engage in any negotiations or arguments. You're the boss. The spirit should, you're the boss, but, and I keep repeating it, and that's the mechanism of the formula, okay? You can be a sweetheart and everything else, but to make the formula work, you've got to have these certain principles uh, in order to build the machinery that's going to run this thing. You're the boss. The spirit should be told that if your wishes are met, you'll be a kind master. You may state that if you're happy with its performance, you'll engrave its seal in precious metal or otherwise immortalize its memory. But that's not a quid pro quo. Never enter into a quid pro quo. If you do this, I'll do this. No. I'll be happy if you do that. You'll please me and we'll be friends if we do that. And I'll be happy to, to you, praise you with great praise on Facebook. <laughs> you know, but don't promise anything. The second you start promising anything within the Solomonic formula, the spirit has successfully evoked you. Tell it that its spiritual status will be elevated as yours is elevated. Do not fall for any suggestions from the spirit to give offerings, sacrifices, or packs. That's another kind of magic. Once you've given the spirit its charge and received assurance that it will be done, then immediately give it license to depart, being careful to remind it that you want everything accomplished without harm, being done to you, your family, your friends, your pets, or your possessions. Now, I'm going to digress just for a second. These loopholes aren't so much because the, the Spirit's trying to trick you and be an evil thing. Look at it this way. Uh, you can only get out of a computer what you have programmed into it. And if the computer uh, is, a, is, is functioning properly, it will execute your commands along the, line, the fastest and easiest lines of least resistance. Are you following me? When you charge a spirit, you're, you're programming. Okay, uh, let's say... I want you to bring me $10,000 within a week or within a month or something like that. So the spirit goes, I'll happily do that. But unless you give specific ways that would be acceptable for you to, uh, uh, to do it, don't do it. Give me the ten thousand dollars, but in no way to, will will doing so harm me physically, mentally, emotionally, or my family, or my fret, uh, my <laughs> my pets, the fragile ecosystem. No, you can find a way to do it without without uh, uh, ruining my life. Okay.
Otherwise, you say, give me $10,000 within a week. Go, or I'll burn your little seal ass in my firebox. Well, the spirit will do its best to cut through all the red tape that stands between you and the $10,000. And that might even include you just walking out of your front door uh, and uh, all of a sudden uh, uh, a car jumps the curb, smashes you against the, the, the door, breaks all of your your breaks your your leg tears your leg off and in a week the insurance company gives you ten thousand dollars okay you see where i'm going with that you want everything accomplished without any harm being done to you your family your friends your pets or your possessions the following is a summary outline of a Goetic evocation. But please avail yourself of the above mentioned texts before attempting the ceremony. Okay. That's where I'm going to stop today and we'll pick this up. Uh, there may be a little interruption in, in what time tomorrow I come on because uh, I I've got some magical duties uh, that I'm privileged to do uh, tomorrow, and I'm not quite sure of the timing of it. But there'll be a there'll be a thing, and I'll continue uh, talking about uh, Goetia this weekend. So, until whatever, continue to be good to yourself, be good to each other, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will.